Hey there guys, welcome to the Ryan Lord official show. We are now actually shooting our second podcast and we've got a very, very special guest on this one that I actually met at an event the other night. So Simon, I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself. The stage is yours. Hello, hi Ryan and thanks very much for having me on. I feel honoured to be in your first two guests. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm Simon Morn. I'm a 20 year veteran of the financial markets where I worked in big corporations. So I worked for companies like the uh, Blue Blood Investor Schroders. And I also worked at investment banks like Goldman Sachs. And then about 12 years ago, I'd had enough of that. So I wanted to step out into the world of technology. That's where it was all happening. But, you know, I'm not a I'm not a coder. You know, I, I, I haven't really written a line of code in anger, certainly not at that point. So you've got to think, well, what can you actually offer these companies, given you're not in the tech world yourself? Yeah. But I've accumulated a lot, a lot of commercial skills over those two decades. And I spent a lot of time analyzing companies, what worked and what didn't from you know, their strategy, obviously, their, the way they market themselves, the way their sales processes work, but also the way they manage people. Uh, and so I got into the, the the tech world that way by basically offering my services um, in, in sales and then eventually into uh, a kind of COO positions where I'm going to be number two to founders. And so about uh, a year ago, having done that with uh, several companies, over the previous uh, decade, I thought, well, look, why not do something where I can help more companies, right? It, it's right. rather than just work one-to-one -one with them, try and do something where you can take that experience and build it into something that, that people can either consult with you with, that you can coach with, uh, or they can take training courses with, you know, try and develop some multi-channel distribution just to kind of share that knowledge that I accumulated. So that's basically how my current company resource leveraging systems came about. And that's where I am today. That's super, super cool. So I guess my question to you would be from all of the experience that you have in your background, what kind of advice would you give to startup founders for one, and then also entrepreneurs that are looking to scale their business? I mean, look, if we talk about startup founders as a kind of tech startup founder yeah um and we can perhaps you know talk a little bit more broadly about smaller businesses as well because obviously a lot of these techniques will apply elsewhere but i guess the biggest piece of advice i've got is don't listen too much to advice mm -hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, like everybody's context is different you might say Oh, you know, I love what Justin Welsh is doing on LinkedIn and and his 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 um his courses. I do. He I teaches. Them. Yeah, exactly. And I've taken that course. Right? <laughs> yeah. But he te he teaches people how to be on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. If that's not your business, then Justin's business model isn't <laughs> going to work all that well for you. Yeah. Equally, you you know you might follow someone really famous over here, like Stephen Bartlett. Yep. He's another one. I've actually got two of his books. I've got Diary of a CEO and I've got his other book, his first book, and I've got a signed copy of that too. Oh, very nice. And uh, yes, <laughs> my mother-in-law was kind enough to give me a copy of that book for, for Christmas. She thought she thought I would, uh, she thought I'd like it. But you know, She's actually, you know that that book is just a giant lead magnet. Yeah. Because if you, if you get right to the very back page, what's, what's the last piece of advice? Mm-hmm. You can it's follow me QR here. Code. And, yeah. It's a QR code to scan and go on his <laughs> newsletter list, right? So yeah. basically the book is just a lead, a giant lead magnet, very, very good one, uh -huh. to get more people onto his newsletter. So if you're not in that business of trying to get more people to a newsletter and make money that way, again, Stephen's advice doing? is going to be useful in the round, but the specifics are going to have to be you know, very much tailored for your business. And that's therefore what, what, you know, I try and do. It's, 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 I teach people frameworks, processes yeah. for managing people, for marketing, your go to market, for your selling and your sales process, yeah. for your finance systems, and then for, for building teamwork 
and, and inspiring people to stay with you because it's really expensive to keep having to hire new people, right? Yeah, of course. But these are just frameworks, right? And then they need to be adapted to your business. So again, I've got a series of exercises to help people do that. But in the end, that's the advice, right? There's no magic bullet. You're not going to read something or watch a video from somebody and go, aha, I got it. Yeah. Now my business will scale. You, you're going to have to say, okay, that's interesting. What did they do? Let me break it down and let me then apply it to my business and figure out what, what will work. And, and this is ultimately just, you are going to learn far, far more from the mistakes you make than from any advice from someone who's been successful. Right, I can tell you, oh, these are all the things I did to scale my first startup, right? And we we sold it for five times revenues, eight figures. You know, everyone was super happy because three years previously, the business looked like it was going to get bust. And, you know, we, we turned the whole thing around. This is how we did it. But there are a lot of little details in there that are going to be slightly different for your own business. And you're only going to figure it out by doing it yourself. That's super, super interesting. So obviously, you know, I'm a person that reads a lot of books myself, right? There's actually a bookshelf behind me that you can't see because I'm in the way of the screen. But I've got like over 100 books on that bookshelf. I've got a Kindle that's full of books. I've got an Audible subscription that's also full of books. But at the same time, as you said, right, you've actually touched on a key point that it's all about the execution, right? You could read all of the books in the world, but if you don't actually execute anything, then, you know, like, what are you really doing? Like, you know, like, would you agree with that or... Oh, no, absolutely. I got to say, if those books are behind you, they've got to be pretty small books. Well, I mean, they're <laughs> over there. Look, as you can see, like they are over there, like literally hiding away because the no, sun no. actually damages my books, unfortunately. So I had to put a sheet in front of them because as you can see over there, there's a whole lot of light that comes through. So most of my books, especially on the top shelf, are damaged. So I had to put a cover on the top, but they are over there and I've got a plant oh, right. over there well, too. that's what so. happens when you podcast from the Caribbean, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish I was, but unfortunately, you know, I have to do with the with the London web but yeah. It's sunny London. Well, no, look, I have books here and here and yeah. all over the house. And look, I, I'm I, I you know, I'm I'm an avid reader and I'm not saying don't read, but but the lesson the lesson is this, right? And, and a lot of the founders that I I talk to, the startup companies, particularly yeah. in the tech world, they're really loath, you know, they're really scared of people copying what they do. Yeah. They go, oh, we can't put this, you know, you, hey, look, you need to have a demo. You need to have an example on your website landing page where people can see what it is you do. Yeah. No, no, no. They've got to sign an NDA. They've, they've got to sign a contract. <laughs> they've got to buy it from us, right? It's like people will just copy it. Yeah. You know what? If you've got competition that wants to copy your stuff, A, that's good because it means you've got a business that's working. Yep. But B, they're going to find a way right? Mm -hmm. They're going to go to one of your clients and they're going to butter them up and they're going to find a way to see what you do and they're going to copy it. That, that I'll tell you a story about that in, in a while, if, if you like, if you yeah. want to come back to that, how, how we had to compete with one of the biggest players in the market. But, but look, people will copy you. Don't worry about giving stuff away for free, right? Because people don't pay you for the idea, right? They'll buy a book for five quid, maybe 10 yeah. quid. I don't know what Stephen's Bartlett's book was. <laughs> yeah. I have to ask my mother-in-law, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, but they're not gonna they're, they're not gonna kind of um spend tens and tens of thousands, but which is often what it costs to implement these things. Yeah. They wanna, if they're gonna do that, they want someone to hold their hand yep. and do it with them. Yep, or, or done for them, right? Do it for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's go. right. <laughs> you know, and that's when they start to pay. 10,000 pounds or more and you know because so that's the key right you know don't be scared to give stuff away for free because people aren't just going to take it and use it and never talk to you again they're going to go this is brilliant yeah now i'm going to pay you to put it everywhere throughout my business yep so that that to, that to me would be uh the lesson from reading right it, it's it's like books are books are fine but you you need to use them to do something else yeah. And I actually belong to, um, you know, one of the world's largest uh, business networking groups. You've probably heard of it. It's called BNI. 
And uh, one thing that they talk about a lot is the thesis of givers gain, right? So you have to give in order to gain, right? And if you look back at all of the old scriptures, no matter what your religion is or spirituality, right? It's all about giving to receive, right? You have to give to receive. So I'm literally just, you know, uh, piggybacking off of what you mentioned about doing things for free. You know, sometimes you have to do things for free in order to build a case study, in order to build a portfolio. And as you said, to actually, you know, show this person that you can provide value to the point where it's so good that they're like, okay, let me actually speak about continuing with your services and then we can get into pricing. And then that person can either become a client of yours or they can at least refer you to other people. Or if you're lucky, they can become a client of yours and refer you to other people. Absolutely. I look, you know, probably a last word on books, but I was uh, <laughs> chatting with a, with, with, a, with a partner of mine in Canada earlier today, and, and he recommended a, a book, which was, uh, it just, if I remember the title properly, it's called um, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. Wow, that, wow. And, <laughs> which, is, which is interesting, because yeah. a lot of books are like 13 Things Mentally Strong People Do Do. Yeah. But this one was, they twisted that, that kind of don't do this yeah but but the essence of the book was basically be nice to people all the time you know yeah give things away you know you mm -hmm. you will you reap what you sow that's and it this is, you know you have being being strong being grateful for what you have today being mentally resilient comes from basically feeling good about yourself and feeling good about other people and and you know and giving is is a critical part of that we yeah. always sell right in the sales process it starts selling starts with serve yep serve first sell second close third in that, that order i love that like that's like that's super super you know super super powerful and i think you know just linking back to the title of that book right I was actually watching something uh, on Alex Hormozzi's channel. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with um, Alex Hormozzi, but he's actually- Everybody really knows Alex, right? Everybody knows Alex <laughs> Hormozzi, right? But he actually had a very interesting concept of thinking about what not to do to become successful. So like, what, what are the things that I shouldn't do in order for me not to be a success? And then you can kind of like reverse engineer it. So you're like, okay, I shouldn't do this, that, and that. So then I should do this, that, and that. Do you know what I mean? So you kind of do it backwards. So I guess that's kind of similar to what the, you know, what the title of the book is suggesting, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and to that point, back on the sales process, you know, yeah. people kind of sit down and 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 they go, oh, you know, we didn't win client X, right? We wanted to sell to them and we didn't get it. So what 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 happened? What 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 went wrong? And then normally you get all the normal excuses. What 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 comes on the list of what's called bant, budget, yeah, I authority, know about need, need, and time. time right? Yeah, I used to work in sales, definitely. Yeah, you well, you you'd have heard it all, and you heard all yeah. the responses for that. And the salesperson's kind of like, oh, you know, well, you know, if we just put this one more feature in the product, they'd buy it. And it's yeah. like, oh, really, did you get that in writing? Yeah, you know, you, you get them to put some money down to to prove that. Yeah, no, in which case they were just blowing smoke up your proverbial right but <laughs> when you do that process what about analyzing your wins it's the yeah. same principle right you you, you got to look at things from both sides why yeah. did we win that contract it's much rarer for people to do that but kind of like what worked and then and then because people say to me because there's there's a, there's a lot of advice around st startups yeah. saying well do things initially that don't scale uh-huh you know, because you're doing it manually and you're just figuring it out and you find out what works. And then what what when you find that out, then you scale the bits that that do work. And it's like, well, what what exactly does that mean? Well, this is a classic example, right? If you get a successful sale, then spend time thinking about why you got it. And did you get it for a reason that can be repeatable? Or did you get it because you knew the person, right? A lot of companies start yeah. up selling to friends and family. Of course. And the friends and family buy from them and they go, brilliant. I got a business here. Let's yeah. go. They hire a couple of people. Maybe they move into an office. They spend a lot of money. And it's like, but outside of their network, they've never tested the product. They haven't yeah. actually got product market fit. Yeah. They've just sold to their network. So that's, 
that's a kind of practical example of how you kind of move from non-scalable to scalable process. It, it's by actually analyzing what works with, with the customers you've been successful to and basically disregarding those friends and family who, let's face it, probably doing you a favor. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 100%. And I think with me, I'm always thinking about things, uh, you know, as you said, like on a scalable level, right? So with me, I always think about how to do something faster and how to do something like more efficiently. So rather than spending my time of, you know, maybe doing or going about a certain uh, process in like an old fashioned manner, I'll think about how can I do it in the most scalable way first before, as you said, thinking about approaching family, friends. And then now I've got to be, uh, you know, the glorified contractor doing all of the work for them. And then now I've got to still be a salesperson in my company. Like I try and think of the processes first and like the cogs in the machine first. So as soon as I do actually have that product or I do actually have that service, I'm like, okay, I know about delegation now. So this person can, uh, you know, have this part, uh, you know, have this specific task to do and I can delegate it to them. And this person over here is more skilled uh, than me in this area. So they can actually do with the delegation there. So that's kind of how I look at things, you know? And then I think about how I'm still going to profit off of that and then how they can make money as well. And I think about profit margins, but I always think ahead of time rather than, okay, I have a product. I'm super excited. I have a service. I'm super excited. I'm going to let the whole world know about it. And then I'm going to be the glorified contractor, work my butt off for this one client for how many months. And then I'm just not scaling now. So you're, you're outsourcing those yeah. additional services, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I yeah. think is a really, really important lesson, right? So pay people for their time exactly, or, or their, their output. And their expertise. When, rather than hiring them. Yeah. When, you know, you're paying them not just for the time they're working, but you're paying them for the whole time. So, you know, you, you know, test the process. There's so many freelancers out there. Yep. So easy to find people nowadays. You know, they've got businesses supporting you, right? Use yep. them bit by bit by bit and then if necessary you can look to bring full-time hires onto the business but you know one of the biggest mistakes i've seen over the the last 10 years and actually with in the position of the company i was working with two a couple of years ago is is that you know they were they just over hired people yep they were like oh we want our own people because, because it looks cool that's why because it looks cool <laughs> because the founder came from a big business yeah he was used to having a lot of people work for him yeah you know and it was it was part of his story that lots of people work for him so he wanted yeah. to do that again but also it came back to that same point about our intellectual property we built something really special here and people are going to steal it mm -hmm. so the only way to steal it is to hire people into our inner circle and you know wrap our arms around them and it's like well how's the world going to find about your product if you're not prepared to open up a bit right yeah you and know, and, you, and, and that's to trust I mean. people more yeah <laughs> those you know trust freelance you know it's, it's their living right it's their yeah. they're not going to stiff you because that's the end of their business if they stiff you right yeah and that's and look like that's my thing at the end of the day like when it comes to you know you as an individual like as an individual person or me as an individual person i know that there's that there's not another Simon. Like, I know that there's not another me. So when it comes to, you know, what I can do and the value that I can offer, I know it can't be replicated anyway. So even if there was a hundred people in this room listening to, you know, what I'm doing and, you know, like how I am and what I've got going on, I know that they're not going to be able to replicate it in the same way that I do because they're not me. So like, that's the, that's the touch that I have on myself. And that's why I'm not scared of, you know, as you mentioned, things like intellectual property and somebody running off with my idea or whatever else. Else, you know like if that's what they want to do good luck to them do you know what i mean so oh I think yeah i mean that, that's a really important point because you know it's easy to get when you're particularly if you're working your own business and you're spending yeah. a lot of time on your own staring at a screen yeah you know, oh this is fine because we're having a conversation right you got a bit of human interaction here and we actually met in person the other night exactly right? yeah right? we had a great really conversation then. Well. get out from behind the screen but you know most of your day is spent staring at the screen, right? Yep. And, and there's this, then you see someone crop up who's in the same business as you, and then someone else, and then someone else. Particularly if you're on a social media site, 
like a LinkedIn, yep. which is going to group you together. Yeah. With some, and you're like, oh, the whole world's doing what I do, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. oh, it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's about how you, you stand know? out. Yeah. Right. It's like people buy from you. That's it. I, I literally right. just said that, you know, before in one of my client meet, you know, my client meetings that people buy from you. Yeah. It's, it's like, you will do things. I, I teach people commercial processes in a particular way, right? Yeah. Not everyone's going to want that, right? Someone's going to want the guy who's just a little bit more straight laced and to do it. And, you know, maybe one poke fun out of them and things like that. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, somebody might like my slightly more <laughs> left, left field approach, right? Yeah. I'm not changing. I'm not yeah. changing. It's, I'm way too old to change, right? Yeah. But, you know, we could be doing exactly the same things. Plenty of room in the market for everybody. You know, I, I mentioned to you before we were coming on about the Professional Speakers Academy that I'm part yeah. of. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. guy that set that up and, and ran it, he's he's made like more than a hundred million pounds worth of sales from that. That's insane. And yeah, and the, the nice. I actually full. I, th I think I think I connected with him on um, on LinkedIn after you told me about the academy. I definitely checked it out. And, Whenever and, somebody and tells Andy me about Harrington. something, I have a look. And Andy Harrington's his name, right? That's it. And we, I was at the most recent quarterly event. Yeah. And you know, there's a hundred people there, and there's. You know, there's a, there's there's 25 more online from all over the world because they couldn't all travel to the in-person event here in London, and um, you know they're going. Well, what about going for you know going for the states, right? The big market, the big market. Yeah. And and he's like, mm, I've been doing this 20 years, you know, and I've made nine figures sales, and That's I've not insane. had to have an American client yet. Wow. There are people there from Europe, and there's one or two people from further afield. Um, but, you know, they'll find you and they'll make that effort. His point was, look, it's a big enough market just here in the UK. Yeah. To make all the money. You've got you to want. focus on that first. You know, you've yeah. got to focus on where yeah. you're at, your territory first. Don't don't be dragged overseas too quickly. And, oh, the dream of America. Or yeah, the America American or dream. Or whatever it is. <laughs> or the dream of China or whatever yeah. it is. Because it's hard working in those markets. I, I've worked in those markets. I've sold in those markets, particularly right. back in the day as a financial services person. And I actually spent five years quite recently in New York. Okay. An American company bought my startup. Okay. And part of the deal was I had to go over there and work with them. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's a complete, it's a different world, right? There's different, yeah. rules, different regulations. There's different laws in every state. Yeah. So, you know, and particularly if you're shipping services to them um, or shipping products, physical yeah. products, like that, you've really got to be careful with all those laws. It's going to cost you a fortune in legal fees. You know, <laughs> don't, don't go there till you've got a really profitable business. You know, the one piece of advice I remember from my time at Goldman Sachs, um, he's in, and they were the head of mergers and acquisitions in Europe. Wow. And he sat there and he said, you cannot diversify away from a problem, mm -hmm. right? If you've got a problem, don't go and buy another company or don't go and open another region because all that's going to happen is you're going to double or triple your problems, right? Yeah. Fix your problem and then expand. So plenty of business here in the UK. It's a great, great, and it's a big economy, right? Yeah. If you're working in a small company like yours or mine, plenty yep. of people here that need good quality service. And I think, and I think, you know, like, um, you know, just to kind of pick up on you working in, uh, in America with the American market, for some reason, and I don't know why, but for some reason, I find that Americans are actually easier to sell to, especially when you have, you know, like a British accent, like they're a lot easier to, to sell to. That's just something that I have picked up on and I've noticed because I also used to sell uh, corporate uh, roundtable events to, um, you know, like vice presidents of like, uh, uh, you know, global companies like uh, Google, um, Nike, um, you know, like you name it. But um, I used to work the American market, right? And um, for some reason, I just feel like, yeah, like they were just a lot easier to sell to. Maybe it's because they hear the foreign accent and, you know, like they're a little bit easier. But yeah, like that's what open. I found. That's I what I feel like. I feel like they're more to being open. sold to because they, they kind of expect it. But my experience is slightly different to yours. Right. My experience is, yeah, they want to listen to 
the pitch, the yeah. presentation, the training with the English accent. Yeah. You know, that really works. But the actual closing and the relationship and the day-to-day -day handling, I always used to use a local for that because yeah. the local would go, would would you know, they would know the ladies' baseball score or they would know, yeah. you, know you know. NFL. And yeah, and one okay. of the big things in, like, in the States, you talk to people, particularly if you're working in kind of white collar business, they go, oh, yeah. where do you go to college? Mm, everyone seems to know what the mascot was from that college. So you say, oh, you know, I was at this college in the middle of Midwest. So and they go, oh, go Wildcats. Yeah. <laughs> Wildcats. Maybe it's because Wildcat is everybody's motto, right? But, yeah. but you know, they'd know, and that would be a real bonding thing. And 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 I found, you know, what I was saying about the serving and the selling, yep. I could do that. But the closing and the account management, mm. they really preferred that American accent. And that's a subtle distinction that, that that I found, both when I was selling into America from London and when I was trying to do the same thing out in New York. Wow, like it's really, it's really, really interesting to see how um, you know, like different people's stories differ, yeah. especially in sales. No, like that's I really you, I can give you another example, not from sales, but I'm not go sure if to talk about this. Go on, go on, let's go. So years ago, back in the day, I worked for a company called Lehman Brothers, mm -hmm. which which actually went bust after I left. But I used to go to the States and the, the, the local guys on the desk, he's going, oh, fantastic, fantastic, Simon. You've got to come down the Whiskey Blue Club with us. <laughs> right. right. The Whiskey Blue Club. I like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It was in some hotel bar in the middle of, the middle of Midtown, right? All right. And um, they just get me to stand at the bar and speak. Mm-hmm. Right. And they go, so be a bit louder, a bit louder, you know, da, 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 da. and then the girls would kind of come in. Right. They go, oh, I love your accent. And then the Americans would come in and take the girls away. And that, <laughs> reminded, that reminded me of the selling. Right. I was there to try bring the client in. Yeah. Over there to close it and get the deal. And it worked exactly the same outside of work as it did in. You might, have that, to, you might have to cut that story for your uh, No, I want I want that story <laughs> in here. I want that story in here because I can actually, you know, I can actually segue off of that myself. I found when I went to America, you know, as you said, like whenever they hear, you know, like uh, you know, like the British accent or, you know, as you said, like the English accent, like when they, you know, like when they hear that, for some reason, you know, like that's helped me, you know, be successful with them over there, especially like the American women um, over the Americans. So it's, it's just different, you know, different people have different experiences. You obviously have more talent than me, Ryan, especially that, that area. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look like souls is souls is souls. And when you're, you know, like when you're, when you're selling to somebody like a product or a service and, you know, you're trying to build a relationship with, you know, like with a lady friend, like it's, it's, it's all souls, you know, like in one way or another and everyone has their own approach. Everyone has their own way of selling. Do you know what I mean? That's unique to them. And I feel like, you know, that sometimes that's a problem with, you know, some companies that I've been at, you know, be it startups or even bigger companies is that like, you know, they want you to sell how they sell and you know sometimes it's not like it's not unique to your style do you know what i mean so you might actually end up adapting you know their way of selling and because you're adapting their way of selling you're kind of taken away from your own authenticity i'm not sure if you've experienced that or if you can kind of understand where i'm coming from yeah i mean this, this i mean this is this is a great stuff in terms of um kind of startup advice and stories but um yeah, I, you know, as I say, I went to work for Goldman Sachs actually yeah. after, after after Lehman Brothers, and Goldman is in a very very successful investment. Super, fund, right? Yeah, they, I know about them. But they are absolutely, or back in the certainly at the time, they're absolutely renowned for the fact that you might show up as a top trader, yeah, with a good track record, but you'd sit down and go, "We don't do it like that here." <laughs> yeah, right. And and there, there was one rule and one rule only which is you fall in with the way we do things otherwise this ain't going to last long and we i don't care how successful you've been how big you were before and, and yeah. all this stuff and actually for that reason goldman used to favor people who they'd had from a very early age yeah uh and they used to have a word for people like me that joined mid-career um i don't know if they still have this but at the time they used to call it laterals laterals lateral you're a lateral right you're not a ground up high and it was all that kind of like that presence of you're not one of us yeah 
My brothers yeah. lived my brothers lived in Devon for 30 years. He mm-hmm. says the locals still don't think I'm one of them. You know, it's a bit like that. <laughs> right and that i think is why a lot of a lot of people want to get out there and do their own business and do their own thing because yeah look that works for goldman it's hugely successful and people can make a lot of money that way right yeah you are there's a part of your soul that you're selling as you say exactly you're, you're not necessarily being yourself and being as free as you possibly can be and that's um you know, that's the reason I don't work there anymore. Great company that it is, is because I, I, you know, I like to do things the way I like to do things. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like something else was, you know, in stock, you know, for you and you have your own journey and you have your own life path. And I think that's what it's about. You know, it's about serving our own journey. It's about serving our own life path. Do you know what I mean? Because everyone was put on this earth, you know, for their own reason and, you know, to serve their own, yeah, you know, to serve their own destiny and their own life path. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, you have to step away from, uh, you know, the money, like, you know, so many people get caught up in the money, but it's like, you know, like life is a lot bigger than that. And sometimes you're selling your, 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 your soul, as you mentioned, or your sanity, um, you know, for something that's made up anyway, really, essentially. So it's just about doing, you know, what you actually enjoy and what will give you the freedom to then pursue, you know, what you're passionate about, you know, or what your hobbies may be. And I guess that's what money allows you to do, right? It allows you to have more freedom and more autonomy in what it is that you want to focus on. Yeah, that that is true. Uh, I mean, the the other thing I would say, and, and not in reference to any particular employer in this space, but I think it's the same for, you know, a lot of people who, who come through school and who do well at school. Yeah. Go to university. Yeah. Who join, like, like business, what I call businesses that are extensions of university where you right. still study and you still take exams and <laughs> right. you know, i'm thinking like accountancy yeah 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 in law and i'm thinking banking yeah you can progress pretty well through those businesses through your 20s just by basically doing what you're told yeah passing your exams yeah and then there comes a point you know maybe you're turning 30 and you're about to be made partner of the law firm and it's like all of a sudden or maybe the accounting firm and all of a sudden you're responsible for bringing revenue in right Mm -hmm. and if all you've done up until that point is whatever anybody told you to do yeah pass exams you know a lot of people find that transition really hard yeah really hard and as a consequence of that you find that you know, a lot of people who go into those professions, you've got, you know, you've got the, you know, I always say with investment banking, you've got the, like the 2% sociopaths who yeah. are going to make it all the way to the C-suite. Yeah. And it's just everybody get out my way. And, you know, you know, that's just, and they do that in any industry. Right. It's and true. then you've got, then you've got kind of like a quarter of the people who are, like super smart in a particular technical area. So you've got the PhDs in astrophysics who are writing the trading algorithms for the investment bank and things like that. And they're not too bothered about promotion and being the boss and what have you. They just want to be left alone to do their stuff. And as nobody else can do it, they're kind of on their own. But yeah. The majority of people who come in are kind of like affable. They get, get to be account managers. They get to talk to clients and they look around and they go, oh yeah, everyone's like me. This must be what being an accountant is or being a lawyer is or being a banker is. But actually, you know what? You get to a certain age and because you're just one of many, yeah, you get spat out, right? Mm-hmm. You, you get spat out because you can be replaced by someone 20 years younger and a whole lot cheaper. Or AI now. <laughs> <laughs> or by, well, you might not even get the job. That's a story. Yeah, yeah like, that's a story right? for another day. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might not even get the job in the first place because of AI. But actually, no, I'm not a believer in, in AI is going to take away a lot of these jobs. I think, no, I think you know, it's going to create more, if anything. Yeah, but you know what? You, you, you've really you made that trade for money. Yeah. And, and all I'm saying is there, you you know, just be very aware of what you're doing, right? It's It's tough being a startup founder. It's tough running your own business. But my goodness, it's your own business, right? Yeah. And no one's going to work. No one's going to work harder than you for, you know, what it is that you believe in. Same way, no one's going to believe in you as much as you believe in yourself. Do you know what I mean? So, um, you know, like if you if you was to paint a canvas, right? Like even if you was to, you know, pick something in this room and 
paint it as a picture everybody's picture will be different but they're all looking at the same thing so i feel like you know that's how it is in life like everybody has their own perception and they're living their own reality within a shared reality based on the experiences that they've been through and you know the things that they know so um yeah you know i'm just pretty much just adding to what it is that you um that you just last said yeah but there's there's a really and it took me a long while to figure this out and actually coming back to books again there's a book by i um a physicist called David Deutsch called The Beginning of Infinity. But it's nice. a much more wide-ranging book than just talking about his work. In He's basically the, the, the godfather of the qu of quantum computer. Nice. And uh, But he talks about the theory of knowledge. Yeah. Right? And, the, and, and how we kind of misunderstand. It, it is exactly your point about the canvas and the picture that we're yeah. all looking. It's all differently, right? So when yep. someone says something to us, Right. It's not like computers sharing data, like you know, one ones and zeros, dashes and dots, and it's yeah. a perfect transfer. Yeah. Right? I'll say something and then you'll go, okay, well, I'm gonna have a perception of that or a concept of that based on my own experience. Yep. So it's gonna be slightly different to even, you know, when I say do 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 do, you know, this is very like this, you're still gonna interpret it differently to me. Of course. And I'll give you a really clear example of how this works, right? If we transferred information human to human, like computer to computer, then everybody would ace algebra, right? Because yeah. you just get it from yeah. the teacher. Oh, yeah, I get that. And you just copy and do it, right? Yeah. But algebra is one of the toughest things that kids find to learn because it's really diff difficult to conceptualize. Yeah. Really, very, very few life experiences where you can go, oh, yeah, I see how that works, right? Yeah. So, you, you know, you, and this is a really important point when you're a startup founder and you're trying to sell. <laughs> I'm, yeah. trying to keep it, I'm trying to keep our stories on topic. Yeah, yeah, you are, you're doing a great, <laughs> trust me, you're doing a great so job. You cannot go into a room and present people your product and expect them to go, oh, yeah, I get it, I'll buy it. Yeah. <laughs> there, as soon as you start speaking, one of them's going to be going, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see I could use that. Or, oh, God, I can see this problem. I can see. And if you're speaking to a room full of people, the tech guy is going to have a different view to the user, going to have yeah. a different guy to the accountant who's going to sign it off. And he's going to have a different view to the boss who's thinking, well, I've got 10 other priorities you know, maybe do I really want this, right? And you're going to have to be able to touch each one of them in your presentation, in in your in your kind of delivery, yeah. and in all your follow up conversations, and you're going to have to approach each one separately. And this is why so many businesses fail to scale. They don't find product like market that. fit because that rhymed, they, fail to scale. But yeah, go yeah, ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they do because they're just going into a meeting and presenting their product and giving a whole load of facts and figures and saying assuming that everyone 100% gets it. Yeah. But they don't, right? Because they're all thinking about it in their own little way, how it affects their lives, da, 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 da. and everybody's different. Yeah, no, you're right. So, like, you know, funny enough, um, you know, kind of talking about uh, startups and um, in particular, uh, you know, kind of relating to my industry, which is, you know, social media, uh, marketing, you know, content creation. Um, how important do you think it is uh, for startups to get their branding right, number one, and then number two, um, to actually be on social media, to produce content for social media and to have a social media presence? And then... The third question is, how important do you think it is for somebody to attach their face to that brand as opposed to, you know, like just posting? Well, look, I would say that it's more important to get your face out there than it is your brand. Yeah. Right. You're not. You know, I know brands are incredibly powerful. Yeah. Right. But Apple's brand was Steve Jobs before yeah. it was Apple. Right. Yeah. You know, that that was, you know, they were one and the same, but the, you know, the, what really made it take off and be dynamic was the fact that he was such a good marketer as well as 
you know, a, a, a sharp businessman. Yeah, right? it, was, it was it was and and you could see that because when he left for 12 years, the company almost went bust. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the, the brand that he created wasn't strong enough for what was basically some pretty incompetent management in the intervening period. But then yeah. he came back and saved it. Right. Uh -huh. And he is the legend of Apple, the world's biggest company. Right. So I, I, I would definitely say get out there on social media and I mean, look, we're connected on LinkedIn, right? You yeah. know the difference. If you're a founder and you put your company page up there and you post the same thing as an individual as you do as a founder, you're going to get five times the impressions on your personal side yep. or on your corporate. That, yep. that, to me, is the answer to your question about where you start. So brand will become important. But listen, don't spend huge amounts of time, money, and effort designing logos, making, you know, you've, you've, you've got to get out there and hustle. You've got to meet people. Now, is social media in, in, important? I think it's increasingly important as a way to meet people, right? Mm. But like we were saying earlier, get out from behind the screen. Go to events like the one that you and I met at. Yeah. There, there are so many of these, these startup events out there now look you don't want us to be going every night because you yeah. know, you could <laughs> there are enough of them but you know you, you, you know, you've got to leave some time to do the work but yeah have a day you know make sure you've got a day or two days a week where you're doing something to network and meet people and then the rest of the time you know you can focus your effort on on social media but i would i really my advice would be to sell through you rather than through your company but i mean what's what's your advice what do you give to sell what do you tell startup companies to do yeah 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 you know um i i you know like, i totally agree with you um you know at the end of the day it is about you know getting out there you know like i was getting out there like i go to networking events etc cetera, etc cetera, and i've generated literally so much opportunities like just within one week of going to different networking events that like it's insane i'm talking about potential clients i'm talking about uh partnership opportunities like so much and you know i've even picked up leads to start my own community as well so like that's something that's coming uh in the future i'm currently working on that now so i'm going to build my own community um and within that community i'm actually going to be uh coaching people and teaching people um about you know sales and marketing right so i'm going to use my uh, corporate experience working for over 12 different companies, you know, that's startup companies and Fortune 500 global companies in sales because all of my positions has, you know, have been in sales, like a business development manager or a sales manager, sales executive, like, you know, an SDR, like, you know, the list goes on. So that's what I'm looking to, you know, to do. And that's what I'm currently doing. So whenever I go to these events, I just build an email list, right? Like I'm connecting with people yeah. similar to what I've done with you. I connect with people, you know, like I, I get their contact information, I connect with them on LinkedIn. And then whenever I am ready to announce something now, I'm not bombarding them with, you know, random newsletters or automatically adding them to, you know, like some email marketing software. I'm personally connecting with them, you know, because I don't connect, I, I don't collect people's information to add them to some kind of funnel, you know, like I have their information to stay in touch. So then when I, you know, do want to launch this or, you know, launch that, then at least I can just, you know, get in touch with them be like, hey, we met here. This is what I'm doing. And, you know, I'd like you to be a part of it. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of my approach. But as you said, like when you go to these events, you also need to have the time to harness those relationships too. So, you know, like you can't just go to, you know, like loads of different random events because then you're not having a time to harness individual relationships with individual characters that you've met on the day of each event. So you're right. It is very important to, you know, set that side, uh, sorry, set that time aside and to actually harness those relationships. Um, can you still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, I still here. Yeah, yeah, okay, perfect, perfect. And then linking back to linking back to your question, even about the importance of social media, 
uh, social media is super super important right so i've actually built um I've, I've built a personal brand on social media but i built a personal brand within the entertainment industry now that's something that a lot of people don't know about me it's something that i'm actually gonna you know tell you about like after this podcast but i've actually built you know my own personal brand within the entertainment industry and i've managed you know to put myself in rooms that i never would have managed you know like i never would have imagined to be in if i didn't have that personal brand if i wasn't putting out content if I, you know, if I wasn't marketing myself in the right way, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, I've even had, uh, you know, like, uh, I'm not really going to mention any names, but billionaires, you know, reach out to me, be like, look, come down to our headquarters, you know, I'd love to have a discussion with you about how we can partner. I've had, you know, like, uh, you know, top, top people within the music industry follow me and within the entertainment industry follow me. But, you know, that wouldn't have come about if it wasn't for me putting myself out there, even like, endorsement deals you know i've had crypto endorsement deals i've had endorsement deals from you know like big companies and um you know even uh you know i've, I've got things going on with like uh halifax bank for example lloyd's tsb i do workshops there this all stems from me creating content and creating that personal brand for myself yeah hugely hugely important you said something about email there which you know this whole <laughs> world of video and podcasts and social media yeah, it's easy to kind of think, oh, email's a bit old school, but you know the 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 podcaster Tim Ferriss. If you're, I mean, he, I know, I know, I know the Ferriss. author Tim Ferriss. And yeah, you know, he, he he's been doing podcasts for ten years now, and interestingly, he says in each phase of his life, it's been about ten years. So he's yeah. now, he's now looking at what the the next the next thing is, but his podcasts have been downloaded over a billion times. That's insane. And when, and when he's <laughs> totally insane, and he's far more famous for for the news for the for the podcast than than, than anything else. Yeah. Um, apart from perhaps you know, it's kind of like Joe Rogan during the four hour work week. But, but oh, I've got that book too. His newsletter, <laughs> yeah, is just there. But when he's asked, and I've heard him ask this several times, what would be the one part of your business that you would keep if everything else was to fall? He'd say, "I want that email list." Yeah, exactly. Newsletter email is because I know from that I could start over. Yeah, and people don't people don't really change their emails, right? Like people change their number maybe once or twice um a year. Some people, depending on who you are, but like you know, like <laughs> I don't know who you're mixing with, mate, and why they've got to keep throwing their phones away. Well, I mean, you know, like if you're if you're if you're like, you know, you know, maybe for example, like a high network individual or just someone that you know networks a lot, sometimes you might end up getting spam calls like me, even you know, like if I belong to certain WhatsApp groups, like you know, I'm starting to get spam calls. I'm thinking, are people selling on my you know selling on my data because before i wasn't getting these kind of calls absolutely they are yeah <laughs> yeah so like you know like that's you know so like that's what it is um you know uh for me you know like i understand that as you said like having an email uh database is so important because people don't really change their emails right like i've still got an email from uh 10 years old i think or 11 years old that i make that i use as my personal email and i'm 27 that's 17 years and i've still got the same email and I guarantee you I'm not going to change it anytime soon so the only email that's different now is obviously like my company email of course but in terms of my personal email it like it's been the same since 10 years old so people don't really change their emails um, and I'm a person that checks my emails all the time anyway so when you are doing a newsletter it's about you know what value are you providing to your audience and what makes you stand out you know with that value because everybody nowadays has a newsletter but not everybody's newsletter is actually good not everybody these newsletter is yeah. actually valuable and not everybody actually knows what they're doing they're just doing it because they think it's the right thing to do and they see other people doing it whereas me like you know i stick to what i personally know and you know what's helped me and what's worked with me i am open to other processes and you know i try other processes but i am also a believer in you know if it's not broken like why do you need to fix it do you know what i mean obviously add new skills on but if something works for you and if you've already got a proven system then you know like why do you need to change it all of a sudden or you know like adapt it because everyone else is doing this and i think that that's the kind of time that we're in right now uh you know everyone's just trying to jump on what everybody else is doing and you know jump on this bandwagon over here and on that bandwagon over there and you know where can i make the most money and before you know it it's like you're just all of your like your attention is being diverted in so many different places that you're actually not getting anything done at all 
because you know you're not focused you haven't got that laser sharp ninja focus on what it is that you want to do what it is that you're passionate at and what it is that you're good at doing yeah exactly we're coming back to where we started right with that it's really easy to look at other people's successes and go Super. oh i should be doing that right Mm -hmm. oh so and so has just just launched a newsletter i'll do that let's let's be clear here you're collecting emails right yeah. because then you own them you don't have to use them for a newsletter you can use them yeah. just as, you, as just as you said right yeah you're just going to use them to stay in touch with that other person you know once in a while and actually yeah. you know what you write back at the beginning you've asked me what advice i would give and i was very bad at this when i was younger and I kind of paying the price now, but uh -huh. get a network and stay in touch with people. Right. Mm -hmm. I basically, I, you know, part of the reason I can, you know, it, but I'm making excuses here, but part of the reason was I worked in London, then I worked in Singapore, then I worked in Kuala Lumpur, then I worked wow. in Hong Kong, then I worked wow. back in London, then I worked uh -huh. in New York, and now I'm back wow. in London. Right? Go, well, you know, you lose touch with people, but you know what? Some of the very best contacts I've got, are from people that I met way back in the mid nineties when I first went overseas and I went to Singapore. Yeah. And, and, you know, and all I can say to people is, you know, network. Great. Meet people, you know, be kind, be generous, serve them first, but stay in contact, right? You never, never know when life's going to take a sharp turn to the left or a sharp turn to the right. And you're going to you, you're suddenly going to need to know somebody that, oh, man, I wish I kept in contact with them from all those years ago because da, 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 right. And yeah. it's not because they've become rich and famous or anything like that, because, yeah. but, you know, let's face it, they're not going to care about about you then if you. Yeah, like that's just, superficial, isn't it? Because you never know, right? You never know who knows what, who knows what, who knows what, you know, who's and related to who. Yeah. Yeah, so and that, like, that's my that's that's my that's going to be. I'm going to change my advice from earlier. My yeah. advice is network and stay in touch with your network. Yeah, you you know, and as they say, like your net, you know, like your net work, your network becomes your net worth. That's it. Yeah. So yeah, you know, like at the end of the day, like you never know who this person can you know refer you to as well do you know what i mean like if you if you if you have a good relationship with somebody and somebody knows you as a social media marketer then at least they can kind of be like a brand ambassador for you now you know like whenever they meet somebody and they say oh actually i'm looking for a social media manager then that person can be like oh, okay well i know you know so and so i have a very close relationship with them and then now they've actually given you that referral and because it's come through a referral that person is now more than likely to work with you as opposed to you know just finding somebody else on the internet that they don't really know and that they have to harness that relationship with so that's why you know it's good to build relationships it's um it's good to you know like um leverage your network and um it's good to actually stand for something you know let people know who you are what it is that you do have a clear message so whenever people um are going to networking events and are out and about then you come to the top of their mind yeah, actually, going back to Tim Ferriss, he tells this Go great ahead. story when he was trying to market the, the yeah. four-hour work week. <laughs> I he got decided, that book. He decided at the time that blogs, you know, blogs were the thing. Yeah. Um, and he needed to get in front of bloggers, and there was one particular blogger who was also, um, a, you know, a, a writer that that he really, really wanted to get in front of but he didn't have a clue how to do it right so what he was doing he was traveling around going to physical events where these bloggers would meet and just hanging around there um not necessarily going into the hall and listening to presentations but just catching them for coffee catching them around the place and he was talking uh and and in between he was chatting to the you know the, the lady on the reception doing the just taking the names and what have you checking people in and, yeah, yeah, 100%. and he's just and he's just oh you know that's what i'm doing and, and he's telling the story as you say telling his mess she's getting up and she says oh it sounds like you want to meet so and so you know she goes i absolutely want to meet him he goes, he's my husband wow <laughs> he had no idea. look at that he had no clue but you know he chatted with her for 10 minutes he was the only person who bothered to stop and have a conversation with her ask her how she was doing that day and it just turned out that she happened to be the wife of the one person he wanted to meet more than anything. That is, you know, like that is, that is insane. And, you know, like that's the, you know, that's the importance of, 
you know, building your network and, you know, we're building relationships and, um, you know, like just to being good to people, because when you're good to people and when you're generally interested in people too, because, you know, that's the thing with me and that's why I'm so good with, you know, my conversations with people and, um, you know, I could conversate for hours on end is because I'm generally interested in people, you know, I'm generally interested in, you know, what a person has going on and, you know, a person's character, a person's upbringing, you know, I'm generally interested in people. So, I feel like, you know, if you're not interested in people, get interested in people. Do you know what I mean? And um, that will help your conversations to flow more naturally and it will allow your relationships to, you know, flourish um, in like a more uh, effective and efficient way. The, the very first module of the course that I teach is, is about people and how to build trust and understanding because a lot of tech founders are naturally more introverted. Of course. That's what I've had and we go through the four basic personality types. Now, look, every year someone comes out with a new book about personality types, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, you know, it's the red people and the blue people and the yellow people and the green people. Or, oh, no, no, yeah. you've, got see, you've got to see these five personality types. And someone else will go, no, no, you've got to see these seven personalities. All of this is two and a half thousand years old. And it basically comes from Hippocrates, right? As of the Hippocratic Oath that the doctors have to take. Yeah. He identified four basic personality types. And they haven't changed in two and a half thousand years. Do you know your personality type? I know mine. I do, yeah. And I'm and I'm actually a little bit more of that introverted. I call them a kind of calculator figure, somebody who likes data, facts and figures and, and things like that, and, and a little bit more introverted. And what we tend to do is is when we're running businesses or in even in our private life, is we tend to attach ourselves to people who are more who are better at networking. Um, what I call controller characters who like to go in and organize people and get things and fixed up. And this is a really key message when you're managing a business and you're hiring people or you're working with people. If you devolve or if, if you hand over the job of communication, of talking to people, passing messages, things like that to somebody else, that may be great because you may think, oh, I freed up my time to work on my tech and program my computer. and so. But that person is now the voice of the company. Uh -huh. That person is, is driving the culture of the business. That person is driving the culture of your business. Is yeah. that what you want? Is that what you want? So no, I, I, I not what you want. And, and I'm absolutely with you. And it's what, it's what I teach in the first module of my program it's like as you said if you're not interested in people get interested in people and introverted people go well how am i going to do that right there are some again there's some very simple processes and techniques that you can put in place that will make everybody a lot more comfortable networking and, and one more thing a little kind of another little fact gem right there. yeah startup genome which is a company that um, basically analyzes startup companies from all over the world. It's got the biggest yeah. base of startup companies. And, it, you know, again, it's like a lot of these other ones. It says, oh, these are the characteristics and what makes a successful <laughs> startup company. Yeah. This one is done from all over the world, not just Silicon Valley. So it, to me, it's the most interesting. And they say the number one founder skill, networking. I love that. I love that. And you know what? Like, that's actually quite, uh, you know, quite funny that you mentioned that because the new community that I'm building on school.com, S-K-O-O-L.com, right? That's actually, you know, uh, a platform that Alex Omozi has invested, um, you know, like the the most amount of his money in. Um, school.com, like, you know, when I'm when I'm building this community, you know, that I'm that I'm currently working on, um, I will actually have courses in there. Uh, for networking as well and how to network with people you know like how to sell yourself how to sell your products and services and also how to market yourself on social media but also uh traditionally as well so yeah you know like we're both kind of you know like in a similar in a you know in a very similar space in regards to you know the value that we're giving back to people and what we're you know trying to achieve and the fact that we're working with founders and uh you know in particular like startup founders um you know like we're in a very very uh you know a similar space 
Um, and we have very, very similar viewpoints, you know, from the conversation that we've had so far. So that's really, really good to, you know, like to know. So I guess, I guess obviously, you know, like we've been running now for almost um, an hour. So I've, I've got like a few more questions before you wrap it up. Uh, so what are your top three favorite books? Like top three, it could be only one book or three books. And then I would also ask like, what are like your top three kind of, you know, entrepreneurs, especially those within like the tech space? Cause I'm like a really big fan of like Peter Phil. Like I like, I like Peter Phil like quite a lot. So yeah. Ooh, controversial. Ah. Controversial. Ah, well, right. he was, you know, he was, he was supposedly the guy that funded Trump in 2016. So if you say oh, you right. like him in New York, you'll be like, Okay. You say you like him in Texas, everyone's like, yeah. Well, I'm going to say I like him in London, but when I go to New York, I'm... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find someone else. <laughs> yeah. Find someone else. Just say Steve Jobs, right? Everyone yeah, or Elon Musk Steve or Jobs, someone. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, look, I'm definitely going to go with the beginning of Infinity. Right. Okay. Beginning um, of Infinity. David, David Deutsch's book. I, th I think that's great. Um, I mean, there's so many other books. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a novel. Okay, okay, right? okay. That's different. Yeah, yeah. I'm I listening. love Kurt Vonnegut, right? Oh yeah, I've Kurt heard about Vonnegut Kurt. Is and, and his particular favorite book of mine, not his most famous one by any means, is a book called Bluebeard. I've uh, heard about that one. Bluebeard. Tell you anything else about it? Right. Okay. Well, Bluebeard. I have to look into Kurt it. Vonnegut is is definitely. Um, on on the list and if i had it sitting here in front of me it's downstairs where i was reading it i would tell you the one that i'm um reading now about improving your writing okay um but i'm gonna get the title wrong um, okay so we're gonna have to do that on another time right so we're kind of gonna have to go to my 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 fourth favorite which is again another book about language yeah how and how uh and it's um and again it's something i read relatively recently so you know these top three lists they always change right all the time yeah but there's a book by uh the, the the tv broadcaster and and, and radio personality by melvin bragg and it's called the adventure of english the adventure of english it is, it is the story of the english language from when it first came over with the uh, frisian invaders the fourth or fifth century um bce uh, so AD, AD, ad right <laughs> um and and how you know, it was almost wiped out by the norman invasion uh it was always kind of before that it'd been almost wiped out by the viking invasion yeah uh, and then then it talks about how it's adapted through the world in in australia or in in in, in america and, and and in place now in places like india and singapore and they're getting their own their own versions of it and it's just a really well written book and 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 um what i love about it is is it's like it, it's got that golden rule of writing right at the end of each section and the end of each chapter it's like a netflix series right they give you something that hooks you go oh i gotta watch the next <laughs> yeah. you know you finish a chapter yeah. and i gotta I got start reading the next one yeah and and, and i haven't seen that a book that well written for some time so they, those are those are my those are my books. That that that's that's actually very very um insightful and uh super interesting. So thank you for sharing it with me and yeah. also with the audience. But funny enough, before you get onto your top three uh favorite uh you know entrepreneurs, um I would like to ask you because you mentioned Netflix and series, right? So like, what is like your favorite Netflix uh series? Um. Well, I'm re-watching Top Boy at the moment. Oh, yeah, wow. Like, I had a funny feeling you would say that. <laughs> a lot of people I, like it. I, I really like that. I mean, we were, my, my wife and I, are huge fans of the House of Cards series. Yeah, I actually yeah. done a workshop with um, Ashley Waters, and I met him, you know, like quite a few times, actually, funny enough. Yeah, he's excellent. He's yeah. Excellent. In fact, both the leads are superb, right? Um, and you can yeah. tell because they came in when it was like series three yeah 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 that's the first one available on netflix they completely transformed it right it's yeah like, like executive producers and they're they're, they're they're yeah they're 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 really they're really cool in that um but we really like the original you know the house of cards the original one from yeah same english version yeah but then, 
then the again someone else is a bit persona non grata nowadays Kevin yeah Spacey, but yeah, yeah. That, that house of cards is certainly the first three or four series absolutely absolutely excellent no like that's super like that's super interesting yeah I, yeah i think i think uh like with the new one they made it a little bit too commercial so yeah like i totally agree with that and then when it comes to the top three entrepreneurs like you know like who are they to you well look i i'm i'm gonna go with with tim ferris because um i listen to a lot of his stuff and he's just fantastic at sharing right, right. what works what doesn't his vulnerabilities um and i just you know i think he is he's just an all-round good guy he deserves the success that that he's got and if you know people just called the tim ferris show if people don't listen to the podcast just have a look at it because it's on a thousand different topics you're going to find something that that you like um through ferris i came across a guy called um sam Korkos. okay who runs a company called levels now i'm really into um kind of longevity yeah the uh breaking what's called the high flick limit i don't know if you know what the high flick limit is but the high flick limit is the number of times of basically a cell or it, it, it's it's how many times a cell can divide that right. determines how old we can be okay so wait like so with his with his company like is this is this a website by any chance because i have heard of like a website with a similar name uh it levelshealth.com all right okay is, is the website it's not no it's not levels.com it's levels. yeah okay right right okay right. and they but what they do is i mean and look the people may be part of the people watching your show may be part of that zoe experiment you know where you put the little oh yeah thing, i've heard about i've heard about that actually yeah, that's it um... glucose spike and yeah, yeah. Know, and stuff well levels levels is basically in the in the u.s doing much the same thing but commercially Okay. Um, but I, the reason why I really like Korkos is because he is he is rigorous about process. Yeah. Right? This is what this is what I do. He didn't say you've got to do it this way. He says <laughs> this is what I do to run my company. Right. And he shares it all on Notion. Oh wow! See, so like Notion, levels Notion, and you can download the templates that he uses to run a startup company. I would, I would, I would like to put my hand up and admit that I haven't actually navigated Notion like I should. If anything, it was Trello, but yeah, Notion. I, I need well, to get up to date. Just use Sam Corcos, C O R C O S, levels Notion. It's a great way to get into Notion. Yeah. Okay. I, look, I, I think for me, uh, you know, I grew up with. You know, when computers were finally invented, I grew up with <laughs> you know, the kind of basic Microsoft tools. I, yeah, to Excel. Me, to me, Notion is just you know, it's it's more it's, advanced. It's an, extension, it's an extension of that. But I mean, I've already got my practices and whatever you're pretty streamlined. But it is actually a great tool to share. And and Sam Corcos at, at, at Levels has got all these processes. If you're into process, and you know, my program's called Profit with Pro through Process, right? Profit yeah. through process. So, you know, process is everything, I think, to running a business. And Sam Corcos is just a great leader uh, to follow on that front. Uh, in terms of another entrepreneur, ooh, I mean, there's there's so many. Who have we got? Who have we got? Let's do a quick let's do a quick drum roll. Who have we got? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think if I went out again, and I think about people that that I really um, look up to, is is is, uh, and, and we, I think I learned a little bit about. Um, Netflix when I was uh, over in the States because oh, yeah. I had a course with one of their former chief product officers. And that was uh, really interesting. And, yeah. and um, but I don't know too much about, you know, the, the, the founder there um, to, to really say uh, he's the guy, but there's some really, there's some, a lot of good stuff on the web about how, how Netflix was built and how it pivoted from obviously being, like a video cd thing yeah on, online and, and, yeah. and they've initially tried to get into video making their own programs and it didn't work the first time a lot of people don't know this but they tried making their own content early on oh wow and and it and it uh, and it and it failed 
Um, so they pulled right back and then they needed money. And so they had to push a lot of advertising on it. Right. And that kind of refloated the company financially after the failed attempt to launch their own pr- content. And then because they never wanted to be in advertising, they pulled all the advertising off and had another <laughs> content. So I think less so perhaps the individual um kind of you know the, the uh himself but the company the story because of the way they've pivoted into two or three different versions of themselves right i think netflix is a fascinating company absolutely uh, that that's um uh, uh that's cheating there uh simon like going straight on to you know what your favorite one of your favorite companies is <laughs> <laughs> but that was going to be the next question yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't he didn't have um a third entrepreneur to mind so he said well i'll tell you what i tell go you ahead. what my absolute favorite entrepreneur let's go let's go let's go definitely another definitely, drum roll <laughs> he is an entrepreneur yourself david, david bowie okay oh oh david bowie david bowie as right? in like the musician I mean, like the musician the right musician, right and he is another person who adapted and changed from, you know, his his seventies, he was a rock and roller, eighties, he's a he was an electro, you know, and, and, and right throughout his life, he was constantly adapting and ahead of the change. But there is a wonderful, wonderful interview with him from like the very late nineties. Right. When he says, This is how the internet's gonna work. And you go back and watch, and he was like, oh, my God, he was so right. Fortune teller. He, well, I mean, he, he was also the first guy who, like, sold the rights for, you know, he, he did what's called the securitization, where basically he said, okay, right, you give me a load of money now, yeah, and you can have the rights to my songs for the next 10 years, right? He did wow. the securitization deal. So he kind of... And and previously, securitizations were just done with housing finance in the US. It was a really specialist area with a lot of gov- government influence and subsidies. Yeah. And, and, and it became mainstream for media people to be able to you do this. And actually, you know, people like yourself can now sell the rights from their content into the future because Bowie pioneered that. That's so insane. There, 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 he actually, as well as the fact I love his music. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneur and basically all-round tech guru he yeah. was he was ahead of his time ahead of his time in, in, in pretty much everything he did wow 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 like that is you know like coming from the entertainment industry myself and being a massive massive fan of music you know i think that you know like you choosing him like <laughs> over anyone else like has really really like you know like made my day because to me, you know, um, I have a huge passion for entertainment and business, right? And music in particular when it comes to entertainment and the music industry is a music business. So it's still a business. So definitely, you know, when you're when you're an artist, when you're an entertainer of any sort, you are still a business, just except you are your own business. So you're representing yourself and you're promoting yourself like you are your own product. So I really, really like that. And then I guess, you know, like just to, you know, wrap things up, um, you know, like just before we just before we do wrap things up, um, I wanted to get into, you know, the crazy story that you was going to tell in the beginning, because I haven't forgot about that. Oh, I can't remember now which one it was. <laughs> okay have you have you okay so look because you can't remember which one it, it was like have you got like any kind of just crazy story about maybe like your experience or any other startups that you know that's done something like uh phenomenal or you know like just just the insane story <laughs> <laughs> i'm scared by the way i'm scared i need to brace myself an insane story you know actually you know what i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna um i I'm going to go back because I was going to tell a little story when you talk about entrepreneurs yeah. of, of Mike Bloomberg. Right? Yeah, Bloomberg, yeah. Bloomberg, Bloomberg, the terminal, billionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bloomberg, also the mayor in New York. Yeah. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, you stood as an independent first and then then pivoted to one of the two parties. But, right. you know, nobody kind of makes it as an independent. He did this, but... And there was a great story. I was chatting with, I met a guy who'd been like one of the first five or six employees 
you know, like startups, say. you always say, oh, yeah. I'm employee number seven or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. employee number six. <laughs> he used to go around to terminals with um, with uh, you know, it, at, at traders and banks and what have you. And, and the big guy, oh, where's Mike? Where's Mike? And he'd be the guy on his hands and knees under someone's desk, plugging the thing in. That's the, the wires. So nowadays we only know him as this kind of like guru figure and like billionaire and leader. He started on his hands and knees, plugging his terminal in. And, and you know, it reminds me, I worked in that finance industry for 20 years, right? And And throughout that time, I used to go and see some really, certainly very, very rich people and reasonably famous within the financial world. They, they typically do their best to be not famous yeah. in other places. Of but, course. And you would never, ever get past, like you go into the nice atrium entry area, you'd be shown into a nice boardroom, you do your presentation, what have you, you'd, you'd leave, right? And you never got any further. And then when I became, when I started working in the, 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 the tech industry and we were working with them and we were rather than kind of giving advice or kind of maybe trying to get information from them and all this type of stuff, it's kind of competitive when you're broking into those kind of hedge fund guys. But when you're in a startup company and you're serving them, then suddenly the doors opened and I went into one particular company called TT, uh, you know, TT Capital. <laughs> TT Capital. I, to me, the office was really small, right? Because I've only ever seen the, 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 the receptionist on the door in a couple of meeting rooms. <laughs> right. The very first time I went in as a tech person, the, the guy went, oh, yeah, come back to my desk and show me. And then the doors opened and there was this huge training floor. Right. Loads of people. Oh, my God, I've been coming here for like 15 years and I never knew this existed. That's insane. And it just shows if you're serving people, if you're giving them something that, that you know, makes their life easier. Yeah. You know, that's basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to make their job easier to do yeah whether that's easier to grow easier to save money or just easier to save time if you're doing that then they will open the door to you yeah and and, and that's not an insane story that's a, that's it. but it was to me it was insane because it, <laughs> oh my god i never even realized that it's huge <laughs> office here with all these people yeah. yeah 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 and that's that's the difference between selling and serving wow serve first serve first i love that and you know like after 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 this podcast uh we're definitely gonna have a discussion about you know like how i can uh yeah you know like serve you know like serve you and what you've got going on so um no definitely and then like just to you know just to wrap it up um what I do in these podcasts is very similar to what Stephen Bartlett does in um, uh, Diary of a CEO. And I actually ask the guests to uh, bring a question forward uh, for the next, um, you know, guest on the show. So uh, what the previous guest has asked, uh, his name is uh, Robertson Hunter Stewart. Like he's actually... Um, you know, manage like over 900 people and he's worked for, you know, super big companies, including uh, Disneyland uh, Paris, you know, just to name one from the top of my head that I can remember. Um, he has put forward a question for you. And the question is, what is the hardest thing to teach? As I said before, the first module I teach is people. Yeah. Because without that understanding of people, you're going to struggle to understand marketing and sales and finance and all the things that come on after that. Right. Yep. But you got to the first person you have to teach people. Teach yourself. About. Yeah. 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 And, and th therefore the biggest challenge and I get it up front and maybe some people, maybe, uh, maybe I lose people that way. Right. Because they're like, yeah. oh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> there. Right. It's, 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 but teaching people to see themselves, their strengths and their weaknesses, learn where they should be 
delegating and where they you know where they should double down and yeah because there's a whole lot of things that flow from that it's like you know really understanding yourself what you're good at yeah helps you a lot with well who should i hire and how should i set my business up and who should i sell to and all this type of thing people people when they come to you as an outside consultant or coach or mentor they're like how do i work better with other people (laughs) get other people to do what i want yeah and the hardest thing is to say, hang on a minute. Let's manage, let's manage you first. And I'm not talking about, you know, get eight hours of sleep and you know, walk six thousand steps a day or you know, go to the gym regularly. I'm not talking about that. There's plenty right. of people who can give better qualified than me to give you advice on that. But I'm just right. talking about mentally. Do you know yourself inside out? Because then that's you can't really manage you can't build trust and understanding with other people because they are you know without them trust and understanding you and if you don't really know how you come across to other people you're going to struggle and so that is the hardest thing to teach and for better or worse it's the thing i try and teach first so then you know that actually that actually leads me on to another very interesting question then do you think that we know ourselves because you know a lot of people you know would say that we don't really know ourselves so how can you be a hundred percent sure that you know yourself and how can you have an understanding of how other people view you i know there's obviously things like self-awareness activities that you can do in order to become a little bit more self-aware and to know yourself a little bit more but do you think that we know each other you sorry that we know ourselves 100 percent? because to me like we are just a product of our environment we're a product of you know uh what we've learned you know what we've seen what we've experienced but just because i'm you know just because i'm a product of that does that really mean that that's me or is that just you know somebody that i become due to those situations if that kind of makes sense yeah i know you know i could get a bit philosophical here and let's go um, i love it i love it (laughs) and talk about do we know ourselves or do we not know ourselves or do we know ourselves and we're denying that knowledge of ourselves we kind of we've kind of accepted who we are but but let me try and answer it in a different way when when we take in information it goes through three broad filters before it becomes a thought this goes back to the theory of knowledge and and how we interpret things it goes through our preferences it goes through our experiences and it goes through our social pressures and as you say you're a product of your environment and that includes the experiences that you've had in your environment but it also includes, you know, like if you're a mem- if you're a supporter of a football club, you know, you support Arsenal, you got to hate Spurs and vice versa, right? Yeah. And, what know, team do you support, by the way? Leicester City. Okay, well, I'm an Arsenal which, fan, so which means at least... I, I guess you were going to be actually. Yeah, you know? I, I was That's actually. Why, why I mentioned it, but for us, <laughs> it's Coventry City, right? Coventry City is the the <laughs> and, 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 and uh, but it's like the Arsenal Tottenham thing, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. less well less well known. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I think that there's um you know, you know that there's that, that you be the more time or the more influenced you are by those people around you, the less well you know yourself is the answer to the question. And this is really important because when you start a company, when you're a startup, yeah. you want to surround yourself with people that, yeah, yeah, I share the vision and do it, but also that are going to do what you say because you've got to get things moving right going from yeah. zero to one it's the hardest thing but when you want that's to another stay, book isn't it zero zero to book. one that's i like that book, book too I've, zero I've got to it. one and then one to a hundred right <laughs> i've got it <laughs> when you want to scale the business from from one to a hundred and scaling is what i teach right not startup but scaling when you want to scale that you've you've got to you've got to break that consensus mindset you've got to get out of that group think and that's when you figure out you you know do i know myself because if 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 the way that you see yourself is not just through your own preferences and experiences but the social interaction you have with people of very similar experience and preferences yep 
then you are not going to make it. You are going to spurn people. You're going to reject people. You're not going to hire people because you're going to go, oh, they're not one of us. They don't get it. But yeah. that's probably exactly the person you need to broaden your market, to expand your network. So I would say there's a real there's a real risk that we don't. We don't know ourselves properly because of the social networks we work in. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Like that is <laughs> that is that is really interesting and uh very uh philos you know uh philosophical. <laughs> I warned you, I warned you be philosophical. <laughs> philosophical, that's the words that I get I get tongue twisted sometimes. But um no, like no, like that is you know, I think I think you actually um you know, like you summarized it uh beautifully. Um, and then I guess, you know, like moving on now to the final, final, final question. <laughs> well, I've actually got like this question and then a question that you would like to ask for the next guest. But right. this question, like this is a big, big question. So brace yourself for this one. Um, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, would you, you know, like, would you like to, you know, kind of share um you know what you know like what your um acu you know like your actual um acquisition uh like like was you know like like how much it was like the acquisition just for other entrepreneurs and founders that are aspiring to be in your position one day okay so the the company was called otas technologies uh -huh. um it was when i joined it it was part of it, it was already going so as i say scaling rather than starting is 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 my strength that's it. It was part of a brokerage business. Um, and there, there are various reasons why it's not a good idea to try and grow a technology company within a brokerage business because right. stock brokerage, you have to keep a lot of money back for the mm -hmm. regulators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But companies, you've got to spend a lot of money to grow. <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be a problem, right? Yeah. So the first thing was we had to spin it out. Right. Right. But, and, and basically, I had to find things like a new office, wow. actually, you know, it, all sort of everything within three days. Wow. When the deal was done, they were like, right, good, right, you're out, go. Wow. They weren't very happy about spinning it out. They said, to the loo. <laughs> but, we, and we, but then we had zero revenue because we'd been getting paid through the stockbroking commissions. Right. So we, had to, we had to go and put, so we're starting over basically from scratch. Although we had clients and people were using their service, they were no longer paying us. So we had to go and sign them up. And then I went, hang on a minute, I pay through. No, 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 that doesn't count anymore. You got to do a deal with us. And so we had to. I, we had to learn contracting. We had to learn negotiation. We had to learn subscription. We had to learn a whole new business model. We had to learn a SARS finance business model, like yeah. really quickly. Because I've heard about that actually. I, I, I've actually heard about that. We had millions of dollars of costs already, right? Right. So we got we and within a within six months, I think, we went from basically zero revenue, although some clients, to three and a half million of, of revenue. That's insane. And, um, that is insane. I can't I can't tell you where we finished because it was part of a deal that I can't tell you. Yeah. Where. We well, I think I think I think was, I have we had some single kind of... digit. We had single digit yeah. re million revenue, like millions of revenues, uh, when we sold the business, and we sold it for about five times revenue. Wow. Okay. Okay. So I <laughs> wow, that's insane. Like I was actually, uh, I was gonna say, um, you know, ten because usually when companies are kind of valued, it's usually at like a ten x multiple. But five times, yeah, no, five times revenue. Um, you know, makes sense. Like that's. Wow, like that's pretty impressive. So, um, and then obviously, you know, like for the founders that don't really understand like acquisitions, like, you know, I've I've got the question before because I've I've actually got um a few books on a uh, VC over there. I've got uh the secrets of uh Sand Hill uh Sand Hill uh Road, I've got um, you know, venture capital uh for dummies, I've got like other books like venture deals and you know, like a lot of books on venture capitalism, but for the people that don't really understand it, um, you know, like when your company actually gets acquired, like when does that money kind of hit your account? Because I hear a lot of people ask me this question. Okay, that's interesting. I thought you were going to ask something completely different there. Yeah. Um, well, remember that a lot of times venture capital 
doesn't want to take over your company they just want to invest in it right yeah exactly um and so they'll give you the money pretty quickly but you've got to be careful how they give it to you okay expand. the earlier stage you are they might give you some what they call preference capital or um convertible debt Mm -hmm. rather than just buy equity they'll say well look you know ryan you want to earn 100 percent of your company right so mm -hmm. we don't want to dilute you you're the man you're the owner so we're just going to give you some debt right and we'll give mm -hmm. you some debt. but but you know there's a, just a few things and if it you know it'll convert into equity if anything goes well won't go wrong won't go wrong because you've got the money <laughs> and actually those covenants that they write into the debt it gives them the gives them the chance to take your con your company on the cheap right it's almost inevitable that one of them you're going to breach because they've done that a hundred times before they know exactly what they're doing right well, and then and then and then from there what can they fire you from the board basically and get oh, someone else on after taking outside money 53 percent of founders are gone within 18 months that's insane. Fifty-three percent of founders are <laughs> that some is of the insane. Big, some of the big companies, like like you know Sequoia Capital, basically, yeah, 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 the biggest of them all, right? I mean, mm. the biggest of them all. They actually, they're loud and proud that oh yeah, we get rid of founders, right? Because they're they're good at starting businesses, and we and we put professional management in that's good at scaling them. They make a big thing about that, so you'll get the money quite quickly. That's not a problem. It's the problem is what obligations do you now have yeah because you've got the money all i can say is be really really careful in the negotiations and you're going to have to read that contract particularly debt contracts and preferred equity capital contracts really well you're going to have to read them really well and and it's i think it's one of those one of those things that you just got to bite the bullet and pay for a decent lawyer Right. Okay. So like how, you know, like how important do you think it is for companies to actually, um, you know, like raise, uh, you know, venture capital then as opposed to kind of like bootstrapping things or maybe rather than go into a VC, just get a few like angel investors. Yeah. I mean, the pros and cons of all of that. I mean, what I'd say is if you have heavy fixed costs, we, we needed an outside investor because we bought a lot of third party data. And we right. bought it from Bloomberg and we bought it from Reuters. And that was the story I was going to tell you, actually, about Bloomberg competing. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Bloomberg, you found it. Look, uh, Bloomberg copying us, right? Because um, we, I went to launch an app on their site. Yeah. And they went, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, put the app on there and we're not going to market it. You'll just be one of 100 apps. And and we were quite early on in there. There's probably thousands of them on there now. And they go, oh, and we take 30% of the revenue. Okay, that's insane. Now that's that's kind of the this you know the standard that Apple takes off the phones now. But and then yeah, I looked through the contract and it and it basically said it says you can just copy this. They're like, no yeah, way. if you put it on our site, then it basically becomes ours. Like, oh my lord! No, 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 it's our intellectual property. They go, not if you want to sell through us, right? This is a really important thing, right? Distribution is massive. Yeah. You I'm think, holding my head right now. Product, in pain. I've met some clients. I know what they want. Distribution is massive. Um, going back to Netflix, right? What yeah. was the one thing that made Netflix really successful? Um, are you asking it? me? Uh, yeah, asking probably me. like probably like their subscription model, like I would believe. It was that they went to TV manufacturers and they got put on Sony and Samsung TVs as the default Oh, no way. That's all smart. Content, business model, subscriptions, all the fantastic things. They just leverage their, their connections, I suppose. Distribution. Because they were on millions of TVs. And when people went, well, how do I get it? Switch your TV on, pal. <laughs> there it is. I've got it. Simple as. Distribution is everything. So, and this is when a VC... Basically, when you're scaling with a VC, right? And when you're moving into private equity as well. So VCs are much more early stage. Angel investors are probably when you're just really starting out. If you just want to have a little bit of money to build a product, go for yeah. an angel. 
monster, right? Absolutely. Probably a VCs won't look at you anyway then. Definitely. And you want to kind of get your first customers, there may be VC. And then when you're scaling a bit bigger, you're going to go for private equity. But typically, those later stage guys, they'll come to you to help you grow. They'll yeah. want to see that you've got a product, you've got a proven market, and you've got a sales process that will repeat. Right? Yeah. And then you go, well, okay, but I need... I need money to expand, right? That distribution, getting getting my app on Sony TVs, you know, yeah. it's going to cost money, right? That's when, so either, either you've got huge fixed costs, like buying data or a lot of R&D, you know, if you're trying to build some kind of new clean energy technology, you're going to have to spend a huge amount of money on R&D, right? You're going to need Definitely. outside capital for those big fixed costs. But the, mm -hmm. either big fixed costs or... You get the VC when you've got a proven business model and you need their help just to go just to the absolute widest possible market. That's that's when that's when you get them involved. And that's what they really love, right? They're not they're not experts in your product, they're not experts in your industry, really. They're experts yeah. in the finance industry, right? Yeah, yeah. Experts at the card table. They buy, you know, they take they they're at lottery tickets, right? They buy 20 lottery tickets and they hope one's gonna work. That's it. And, and they don't care whether it's you or not. But if if all they have to do is give you money and you're going to grow rapidly, that, Beautiful. Is, their, that is their favorite thing. <laughs> Beautiful. And, and yeah, you if you, you're in that position, you'll get a much better deal. And there's a few things that you have to do to show them that, that you can do it. Most founders have got no idea. Most founders have got no idea. So one of the things I do, obviously a bit of a plug here, but... One thing I do is I is I in my find the finance element of my course teaches people the ratios and the numbers that the venture capital that you guys really look at. And look, I post about I've been posting about them on LinkedIn. Um, if, if you know people check out my profile, yeah, uh, please I, like plug all of your socials. Yeah, yeah, right now, we Simon, let us see Morn. You know, LinkedIn. So Morn's M A U G H A N. People may be, even be able to see it on the on the screen here. On LinkedIn, I've actually put up some of the startup ratios and key ratios there on a video, which you can access for free. Have you have you have you got like an Instagram, maybe like a TikTok, maybe like X that you want to share, or is it I, just? I'm not a leave? big user of X. Um, I mean, I think what I would say is uh, I write a newsletter which also shares exercises yeah. that you can do to take some of this learning and actually apply it to your business yeah That's, so you you can find me at the profit elevator on, on beehive the newsletter site yeah so profit elevator like is in the lift but yeah american <laughs> elevator. Yeah. um and and for those and those people who like some of the more philosophical stuff we've been talking about you can find me on substack uh and i write a newsletter there called the sniff test I love that. I love that. And then now, like, what is your next question for our next guest? Well, this is one that I get a lot from, because, you know, I say I help the companies scale up, but I, I get a lot. I mean, a lot of companies, like at the event that we at, we were at, yeah. we guys who were just starting out. Okay. And it's it's not my natural market to help them. Yeah. Um, and I think what would what would really help them is is the answer to this question, which maybe you can ask the next person, which is, how did you get your first customer? How did you get your first customer, or how and, do you? And, and maybe you want to qualify that, and you know they say, oh well, it was my dad. No, no, yeah. no. How did you get your first customer from outside your network? Okay, how did you get your first customer from outside your network? I, I think a lot of people starting out in the startup business, they've got a great idea for what they want to do, but they're like. How do I sell it? I love that. I love that. And is is that is that is that just for like a startup founder? Because the next person I have, funny enough, I've actually got another podcast in like 13 minutes with <laughs> the next guest. But um, like they are within the world of sales, B2B sales. They have basically um, you know, like a sales agency. Um, and they help, you know, oh, perfect. Uh, and they help companies, you know, How uh, did they right take them right back to the beginning of their career. Yeah. And get them to tell you the story of the first sale they ever did. Because believe me, you know this, you know this as well as I do. No salesperson forgets their first sale. 
no souls person forgets their first soul. It's like it's like riding a bike, isn't it? Yeah. So get them get them to tell you the story of their first ever sale. Okay, that's like that's absolutely amazing. I will a hundred and fifty percent do that. I'm gonna get them to tell uh, you know, the audience, um, you know, like the story um of their first sale. And then is there anything else? that you would kind of like to, you know, like leave the, you know, leave the audience with maybe like, you know, words of wisdom, like a quote, like, is there anything else that you'd like to, you know, leave the audience with before we finally say goodbye? Well, well, look, you know, the broad principles are, you know, be kind to everyone. Right. And we talked about serve, sell, close, right. Serve, and don't sell, close. Forget that. But we've talked about that before. So the one other thing I would, I would say that's really really important um when you're starting out and you've got to have confidence and you've got to have belief and you've got to get over all the people that say no but remember this good product does not sell itself your business you're the number one salesperson never forget that i love that i love that and you know like me being the confident person that i am you know like you would you would one day see simon here as a as a testimonial for what i'm willing to you know what i'm willing to uh, you know serve you with and propose to you so that's me you know like showing my level of confidence and you know in in front of the the audience and uh, and also yourself simon so yeah i appreciate you coming on the show um, and I just want to say to everybody that stayed to the end, you know, thank you for staying to the end of the podcast. You know, make sure you hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit that like button and drop a comment in the comment section because that actually helps to, you know, build engagement and that helps to push this video out to the people that need to see it the most. And also any questions that you have for Simon, you could leave in a comment section or you could actually connect with him on LinkedIn and, you know, you can ask him there. But um, yeah, you know, that was it, everybody. And uh, I'll see you in the next episode.